Good morning. Is, is the microphone on? Hold on. Yep, I'm on. A miracle happened just now um, because I took my mask off and, and it's the first time probably in weeks that the mask hasn't got caught on my glasses when I take it off. Every time. Does that happen with anybody else? Yeah. And only on this ear. Only on this ear. I don't know. Put it on and I take it off and it's wrapped around the, <coughs> the stem of my glasses but only on this side. I don't know. So that's a miracle. God is moving today in miracles. It's, 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 I was just, as we were worshiping, there, it's really weird. we're in really weird times, aren't we? Yeah. Sorry, just want to say welcome. Add my welcome to everybody uh, here live and online. It's great to um, have you with us. I'm Tim, one of the leaders here at Christian Life Church. And it's great to be sharing with you this morning. <clears throat> but it is really weird, these times. Everything's changed. Um, so uh, we're, we're singing, uh, My Soul Cries Out, which for us in the room is very apt because our voices can't cry out. We love usually to be packed here together and sing. And so we have to understand that God looks at the heart. The heart of worship is about, about the heart. It's about our hearts. And so we really have to hold on to that because it's not how we would choose to worship. We like to be packed in here together and with our masks off and singing, joining in, but our hearts are joining in. So I don't know about you, I'm finding I'm using my hands more, raising my hands because I can't raise my voice. But, but in all this, as, as Dan said, God is the same. God is the same. The history of the church is that it, we did, it wasn't always easy. Generally, the history of the church in, in the Bible, history of God's people, is uh, that God took them through many difficult times. And this is a difficult time, not just for the church, but for the whole world. But God has called us as church to, to prosper in this time. And we're kind of finding our way. But the first thing is to prosper in our hearts. Um, <coughs> so we're in a series uh, preaching through the Old Testament book of Nehemiah. Uh, and then you may have noticed that we're not going through sequentially uh, week by week. So we had quite a few weeks we couldn't get out of chapter 1. Uh, because we're preaching what God's put in our hearts. So I encourage you to read the whole book. It's at one story, and uh, it's great to read the whole story and get the story. It's really inspiring. Uh, so last week, Jason leapt to the uh, last chapter. So I'm going to get on track a bit more and go back to chapter 2. And my title this morning is, Let Us Arise and Build. So uh, you, if you want to say that with me, one, two, three, let us arise and build. Because I, I want that to be a cry in our hearts. Hope you're doing that at home as well. So, as, as we've said in previous weeks, the book of Nehemiah is the story of a man called Nehemiah. He was a Jew who was in exile, as most Jews were, in, around 445 BC. Uh, prior to that, some had gone back by the permission of the emperor to start to rebuild Jerusalem. But God raised up Nehemiah as the man to go back and rebuild the walls of the city that were, uh, had been broken down for many years. And he rebuilt the uh, walls of the city and did many reforms in the city. But um, there's, there's lots of great stories in there, but remember there's also a spiritual uh, aspect of this, like a parable. Um, the name Nehemiah, and names are really important in the Bible, the name Nehemiah means comforter. And uh, the Holy Spirit is also called comforter. And Nehemiah, I am told by those who study these things much more than I do, that Nehemiah is a picture of the Holy Spirit. And so the rebuilding of walls can be pictured in many, many ways, actually. But how, uh, one of part of it is how uh, God, the Holy Spirit rebuilds in our lives, rebuilds our souls that have been broken down. So I'm going to pick up the story uh, for, and look at what God's put on my heart uh, in Nehemiah chapter 2, starting from verse 16. At this point, Nehemiah has gone back from where he was in exile, back to Jerusalem. He's been there a few days and he's done a recce of the city. He's looked around with a couple of men and he's not told anybody what his plans are. And then he meets with the leaders of the city. And in verse 16 it says, The officials did not know where I had gone 
or what I was doing, because as yet I had said nothing to the Jews or the priests or nobles or officials or any others who would be doing the work. It's interesting, he's already decided they're going to do the work and now he's just going to tell them. Great, isn't it, when you get a job that you've not applied for, that's no pay. <coughs> then he said, then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burnt with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of, of my God on me and what the king had said to me. They replied, let us arise and build. So they began this good work. Uh, that's in chapter 2. In chapter 3, we see how they immediately started to work and to rebuild the walls. And we'll look at that in a minute, chapter 3. It speaks of individual responsibility and it also speaks of uh, working together. And we could look at rebuilding in many, many ways, many aspects. Of that. We look at, we look, look at uh, rebuilding in terms of rebuilding business. And actually right now, the economy of business will need a lot of rebuilding. So it's very apt to these times. Um, social life will need some rebuilding. Uh, could, it could look at speaking to many areas, politics, uh, uh, arts, whatever. But I want to look at a specific area that God's put on my heart. And I also want to look at some of the difficulties that we face in rebuilding. Picking it all up from the story of Nehemiah. So as I say, there's many areas that need to rebuild. And as I've been preparing, I've felt that uh, just as Nehemiah said to his, the people in Jerusalem, come, let us, uh, what do you say, come, let us build the walls of Jerusalem. The, whole, the Holy Spirit is saying to his church, come, let us build the society, the community, the every area of life. And please note, these guys that he was talking to were not builders. They're not builders. They didn't know how to build. And yet their response straight away was, let us arise and build. It was a response of the heart. It came from the heart. Not, oh, I know how to do this, I can do this. It was, no, I'm prepared. God doesn't look necessarily for the, the people who are, are, are able. He looks for the people who are available. And that's what God wants, is a, a response from the heart. And interestingly, you see that, that these, the walls had been broken down for hundreds of years. And for several years, the people of, the, of Jerusalem, the Jews, had been living there and the walls were broken down. And as he says, as Nehemiah says to them, they're in a desperate situation. A disgrace, he calls it. And yet they, for many years, had done nothing. They got used to it. They just accepted it. But Nehemiah, as a picture of the Holy Spirit, comes and in that few, what seems to be a few sentences, brings them to a place where they rise up and build. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. Sometimes we may have been kind of in accepting of the uh, destruction in our lives, destruction around us, but for years, and do nothing. But the Holy Spirit comes and gives us hope again to rise up and build. But he's looking for a response for us to say, let us arise and build from the heart. I want to focus this morning on building individual lives, families and the church because the church is made up of people and although we want to rebuild society we want to build uh, the economy we want to rebuild uh, social uh, the social <coughs> life of the of the of the city and of its country i believe god wants to do it through his church that's the that's what who god has chosen to influence society he's chosen us so I want to look at first, uh, our, first our responsibility and then I'll, there's a couple of steps I want to look, look at in uh, building up people in the church. Okay? So, chapter 3. Chapter 3 is basically a list of um, who built. And he starts off with uh, one of the gates and then he goes round and said next to him 
so-and-so built, and then so-and-so. And he goes right round the walls of the city, naming the people that built. And I'm going to just uh, pick a few. But in there, as I said, there was no expert builders. There was perfume makers. There was goldsmiths. People that you wouldn't think would be much good at brick, you know, stones and mortar and that kind of stuff. But they were willing and God used them. So, I'm going to read a few verses. Verse 10 says, Jediah, son of Harum, Harumath, made repairs opposite his house. Verse 22. Beyond them, Benjamin and Hashub made repairs in front of their house. And next to them, Azariah, son of Marseah, the son of Ananiah, made repairs beside his house. Above the horse gate, the priest, the, uh, above the horse gate, the priest made repairs each in front of his own house. Next to them, Zadok, son of Immer, made repairs opposite his house. So these are people that built the wall outside their house. Right in front of them, they said, that's my bit of wall. When in the Bible it says house, often it also means, because it's a, not written in English originally, the word that they use can mean house or household. We've heard a lot of our households these days, and they were allowed to mix households these days, but it, household is a, is a family or an individual or a couple living in a house. It's that community in the home. And I believe that the strength of the church, the strength of the walls of the church, if you like, is fundamentally down to the strength of the households. It's twofold, actually. First, the strength of the household, the individual, the couple, the family, in each house, they've got to be strong. That's the first. The strength of the church is down to the strength of the households and the strength of the links between them. It's the connections. It's not ultimately about the, the strength of the preaching or the meetings or that. It's the strength of the people and the relationships between them. Amen? Good, thank you. It's really strange preaching to people with masks on because I can't tell whether you're smiling or scowling. You can tell whether it's going well or not. <coughs> I can see your eyes. If you go to sleep, I can tell. I can still see if you go to sleep. So I want to look at building up the church through um, the households, if you like, the individuals and the families. So the first step is about each house. So the question is, how strong is your Household. How strong are you in your house? Is there some rebuilding needed in you and your household? Um, the first and most important step of building in the house is the step that actually uh, it just precedes the book of Nehemiah. It's the step, first step that the people did when they went back to Jerusalem after exile. First thing they did was they rebuilt the temple. First thing, the temple. And that talks about the presence of God, of worship of God, of putting God in the centre. And in the centre, in the, in, in the city of Jerusalem, within the walls was the temple. And even before the walls were built, they built, rebuilt the temple to say, this is God's city. God rules here. We, we give him his place. And that is the first thing we must do in building our house, our household, our family. We must put God in the center. Uh, in Joshua 24, Joshua speaks to the people of God, um, and it's not long before he dies, and he asks them to make a choice. And the choice is simply to serve God or not. Are you going to serve God or not? There's just a very clear choice, and he says, no sitting on the fence, make a choice. And then he says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And that's what it takes, is that declaration, that decision. Yes, our house is going to be a house that serves God. Our family. And, and to, I, I read it, I, I kind of sense this. Because it, you read in the context of what he's saying. he's saying. He's saying it's going to be too hard for you to follow God. Not going to do it. But he says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As though you can all decide to go away from God. But I will serve God. Me and my house will serve God. And we, 
takes the strength of the churches where we have individuals who say, no, it doesn't matter what everybody else does, we're going we're gonna to serve God. Amen. Thank you. So, <clears throat> what does that mean practically? So, some more questions for you in asking you, you know, how strong is your house? Is your relationship with God as good as it was? Or as good as you desire it to be? Is it as strong as that? Do you have a heart to, to read the Bible, to pray, to put God in the centre? Or has that kind of waned a bit? Is your love for God not as it used to be? In, in Revelation, um, Jesus rebukes one of the churches to say, I have this against you. It praises them for many things, but I have this against you. You've lost your first love. It's important that we have a love for God as we did and it, it's easy to lose it, isn't it? Well, I think it is. Anyway, I find it, it's not difficult to lose your first love. Is your love as it should be? Um, a short while ago, Adriana and I, we, would, we chatted about this. And we said we, said we kind of lost hunger for God. The hunger for his word to pray. And we don't like this, but we've lost it. And our prayers, we've not stopped praying as a family. They've kind of been a bit boring and selfish. And thank you for today, God. And uh, help us sleep well tonight and have a good day tomorrow. Maybe a little bit more exciting than that. But it's that kind of just a ritual. And we said, this is not good. And um, this is not the first time we've had this conversation or this type of conversation. So when you've had this type of conversation a few times, uh, then it feels a bit, uh, uh, here we are again, and you can feel a bit downhearted, yeah? Um, but we prayed. It's not that we'd never pray. We prayed for that. And God has helped us. We're praying more. We're praying together for, for more uh, things beyond us. We've, we've, our prayer times have been good, me and Dree, and we've... And we've um, God has helped us. I, I had a meeting with some leaders uh, a while back, and I, as I was uh, going to the meeting, I just felt, Do you know, I, I feel a, a rise of hope in me. I just feel more hopeful. Why is that? The Holy Spirit helped me. The Holy Spirit does that. That's what the Holy Spirit did for these people who had been sitting with a broken down wall for years and years and years. He inspired them through the words of Nehemiah but it's God that inspires and isn't it, isn't it true that so often we can, we can settle for a, a, a less than on fire for God we, and, and if we settle for long we think I don't know how to get back I don't know how to recapture that Holy Spirit comes and helps us you know I, I was thinking as, another thing I was thinking as we were worshipping is it, it What's really inspiring is to be all together in this room with no mass singing. And we can't do that. But the Holy Spirit is not inhibited to come to our hearts and inspire us. That's what we want. And so I'm sure that many have gone through this. And, you know, the whole fatigue of lockdown. You know, it, at the beginning, maybe, at the beginning, for me, it was, well, it's different cope with it and you kind of yeah we're going to cope with it and then after a while you get fatigue it's quite common in this kind of situation after six months you think oh, okay, well, it needs to go back in you but we've the holy spirit comes and lifts us again so that's what the main thing i'm asking the first thing sorry, the first thing in asking does do you need to do some rebuilding in your family the first thing i'm asking is how's your relationship with god no condemnation there. No condemnation. You know, Nehemiah didn't go to condemn the people saying, we're in disgrace. He said, let's lift ourselves out of this disgrace. And they were inspired. They weren't condemned. The Holy Spirit will not condemn you. He's coming to say, come on, let's, let's rise up again. Let us arise and build. Yeah, that's the, that's the kind of cry I want to have on my heart, that's to have on our hearts. Let us arise and build. And the first thing is in our family. 
And don't give up. You know, uh, <coughs> often the pattern with these things is, you say, right, I'm going to read uh, Nehemiah every day, chapter of Nehemiah a day. And then after three days, you miss a day. Has anybody done that? I've done that countless times. Countless times. The thing is, it's, 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 it's never right to give up. Always too soon to give up. Just got to try again. Maybe a different version of the Bible, a different way of it, a different time. Just don't give up. We can't give up. That's not an option. We will fail and we'll fall, but don't give up. The Bible says a righteous man falls seven times, but he gets up again. There's a promise for you. You're going to fall seven times. We are going to fall, but we're going to get up again. Other thing that might, you, might, I, you might need to ask yourself in your household, does your marriage need some rebuilding? Does your marriage need some rebuilding? Have you lost your first love there? Is there, is there something you need to do about that? Do something. I'm not going to do a whole marriage seminar now, but uh, sometimes in a marriage you just need to, we've got to rebuild. Pray. Does your parenting your relationship with your children needs some rebuilding. Of course, it takes, as with the marriage, it takes two, but we, we can do what we can do from our side. Ask God to help. Pray. Do something. Don't despair. Don't give up. If you fail, try again. Does something need rebuilding in your household? That's the first step. And if there is, let us arise and build. Let us arise and build. So that's the first step, is your house. The second step, uh, if we look at the picture of building the wall, is your neighbours. Now there's no way that they could have built, rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem if each person was blinkered only building the bit in front of his house. They had to work with each other. And they worked with the person on the right, the person on the left, the house on the right, on the left. The builders on the right, the builders on the left. Now, I'm sure that some builders were quicker than others. I'm not sure how a goldsmith who works intricately with little details is going to be good with big stones. Or a perfume maker compared with a builder. But they all did it. Interestingly... In chapter 4, verse 6, it says this. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height. For the people worked with all their heart. All of it reached half height. So there wasn't some bits where there was a builder doing it that were really high and the perfume maker still struggling down here. No, it all got to half height. What does that mean? It means two things. They connected so first, you know, if, if I'm building in front of my house, and my neighbour is building in front of his house, then I'm going to draw a line here and say, this is the line where my garden ends, and I'm going to build to there. And maybe he's going to say, well, I'm going to build to here. But definitely, I've measured it up from my house, it's here. And there's a gap. And what we're going to do, we're going to argue, we're going to fight over it, or we're going to agree. No, it doesn't matter, we'll just make sure they build. Now the other thing that <coughs> needs to happen, if I build on my line straight up and he builds straight up on the same line, it's not, there's going to be no strength. The stones have to overlap. I have to put my stone over his side and over his side. We have to work together. It's, not, it's about building up your part, your responsibility, your household. But it's about working together with the person on your right and the person on your left. And they helped each other. So the people that, that were quicker must have helped the people that were slower. Because those stones have got over, I can't get up to here if my neighbour's down here. I've got to help him, at least with this part, to go higher. And it says it all came up to half height. There's a principle in the Bible where, though, you know, when they were collecting the, the manna, it says those that collect little didn't have too little, and those that collected much didn't have too much. But somehow, they all had what they needed. And in this wall, somehow, they built it 
the same height. It doesn't say that the quick ones built, helped the slow ones, but they must have done. I just think it's not recorded because they didn't want to expose anybody. They just wanted to communicate they worked all together with all their heart. So what's the application of that for us as a church, as us as a people? In CLC, but beyond. First, we all need to take responsibility to strengthen the church, to see a strong church that will go and build a, a strong society in many ways. We need to take responsibility for our own house. What is it I need to rebuild in my house in terms of maybe my relationship with God, <coughs> my, my marriage, whatever? What do I need to take responsibility for? And then I need to take responsibility for somebody on my right and somebody on my left. If we all take responsibility to pray for two other people who will also help us, yeah? Find two people that you say, will you pray for me, I'll pray for you. Pray for them. And if that was all perfect, it would go right around the church perfectly. But obviously, what's going to happen is we have small groups. But it's not a minimum to. No, it is a minimum. It's not a maximum. It's not like you can't pray for three people. But if we all pray and help a minimum of two people that will also pray for us, then if it all works perfectly, the whole church will be covered. Yeah? That's what happened in the wall of Jerusalem. Wouldn't it, but wouldn't it be so great if each of us knew, had two, peop, two people or individuals or families that we prayed for that we knew had our back? Everybody in the church. That would be a very strong church. That would be a strong church. And that, that's the picture that God is giving me, is that, that we need to at least take responsibility for somebody on our right, if you like, and somebody on our left, and say to them, and pray for them, or her, or them, and say, this is where I'm rebuilding. Maybe I'm struggling. Will you pray for me? And is there anything I can do to help? That would be a strong church. Ask, what are you rebuilding? How can I pray? How can I help? Three questions. I'll make it simple. Two questions. How can I pray for you? Is there anything I can do? Remember that? How can I pray for you? Is there anything you can do? If we all took responsibility for two people, at least, that, would, that could transform and rebuild our church very quickly. Amen? So, that's the first point. That's the main point really is, each of us needs to take responsibility. Ask the question, what do I need to build in my life or rebuild? Who are the two people, two families that I can uh, ask for help and help? You remember that? Okay. Just want to <clears throat> briefly uh, say the second part is that there will be opposition. There will be difficulties to this. It's not, it's, you know, he inspired them and they said, let us rebuild before they had any clue what they were getting themselves into. So I read from chapter 2, verse 14 to 18, which ends, so they began this good work. That's the end of chapter, uh, verse 18. Read verse 19, straight after, next verse. But when Sanballat, the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite, official, and Geshem the Arab heard about this, they mocked and ridiculed us. What is this you are doing, they asked. Are you rebelling against the king? Straight off, verse after they said, we're going to rebuild opposition. Mocking, ridicule, and accusation. Again, this is a, this is a, Sambala is a, is a, like a figure, a picture of, of Satan. The accuser. He's always accusing them. And this accusation, you're rebelling against the king. The king had sent Nehemiah. The king was for it. And so, Nehemiah responds straight off. I replied, the God of heaven will help us succeed. We, his servants, will start rebuilding this wall. He just restated the intention. We will rebuild. We will arise and rebuild. We will arise. Let us arise and build. And we will do it. Straight away, the uh, <coughs> accusations come. And, and you'll find that 
Whenever you want to do something for God, there will be accusation, there will be mocking, ridicule. Chapter 4. If you, re- if you look at chapter 4 in your Bible, in my Bible, a lot of Bibles, there's a title at the top of chapter 4, and the title is, Enemies Oppose the Rebuilding. Uh, I'm reading from verse 1. Sanballat was very angry when he learned that we were rebuilding the wall. He flew into a rage and mocked the Jews, saying in front of his friends and the Sumerian army officers, what does this bunch of poor, feeble Jews think they're doing? Do they think they can can build this wall in a single day by just offering a few sacrifices? Do they actually think they can make something something of stones from a rubbish heap and charred ones at that. Tobiah the Ammonite, who was standing beside him, remarked, that stone wall would collapse if even a fox walked along the top of it. This is, this is just the enemy. This is, uh, you know, one thing that I won't deny is that we, as his people, we're called living stones. Yeah? The Bible and it is that we're being built into his house. We're living stones. But uh, he describes the stones from a rubbish heap and burnt ones at that. But we are. God has picked us from the rubbish heap. We've been burnt by life. We've been uh, muddied by sin. But God has picked it up as a cleanser. Do we actually think that God can make something of these stones from a rubbish heap? Yes, we flipping do. But the enemy wants to come and say, No. It's rubbish. Look at the church. It's ridiculous. Even if a fox walked over it. Nehemiah then used the strongest weapon he had. Verse 4. Then I prayed. Hear us, O God, for we are being mocked. You know, when the church, church, Jerusalem, you read in the Bible, was beloved of God. Symbol of his love for his people. Love Jerusalem. And the enemies mocked. God gets angry at that. You know, God is on our side to strengthen us when we're mocked. Two weapons that we have. The greatest weapon, I believe, is prayer. To pray. And the other, another great weapon is to declare. Declare, no, God has spoken, let us arise and build. The other struggles you see, chapter 6 has another, uh, the title of chapter 6 in my Bible is more opposition. So it's there, right through. They are opposed, but they carry on. Other struggles they have, verse 10 in chapter 4 are weariness. They get to half height and they say, we're tired, there is so much rubble. You know, sometimes... It feels like there's so much baggage to sort out, so much uh, brokenness we have to sort out that we get tired. But we need to carry on in the strength of God. Intimidation and fear. In chapter 6, you'll see they, the enemy just intimidated, brought fear to them. We have to pray. And this is where, you know, the pray for your left and right. It is wearying sometimes to feel you're on your own. Isn't it great where somebody comes along and says, I'm standing with you, I'm praying, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. If we do that, then we can rebuild. So just in summary, just in conclusion, to rebuild society, the world, we need to make sure the church is strong. The church is strong when its individuals and families are strong and their links with others, each other, are strong. What is it that you need to strengthen in your house, in your life? And then, and it's not like get that sorted and then help one another. I just want to say, it's not get that, we'll never get that sorted. We're, we're in a journey. But while you're doing that, help a person on your right, a person on your left. So your homework, if you like, is to ask yourself, what is it I need to rebuild? Ask God for help. The Holy Spirit will help you. And to ask, who am I going to help? What family, what person am I going to stand with in prayer until they get their wall rebuilt? So I want to pray. I want to pray for uh, us all. I want to specifically focus on a few things. I want to pray for those needing 
some refreshing, restoring. You know, uh, me and Adriana prayed. I just, it wasn't immediate. I just noticed over days that the Holy Spirit had come and refreshed me. And if you're weary, it's wearying times, pray for strength. And I want to leave you with a challenge to rebuild and find those to others. So, Father, thank you for this picture of Nehemiah. It's a picture of your Holy Spirit who comes and changes, changes the situation by changing the hearts of the people. That you cause them to say, let us arise and build. And I pray that, Holy Spirit, you come where we just perhaps weary and dull in our spiritual life. We just don't know how we're going to lift us up. And it's, we have to confess that we are not able to lift ourselves up. Your Spirit comes and lifts us up. Pray your Spirit will come to many who are reaching out to you now and saying, yeah, help me, Lord. If that's you, just put your hand on your heart. Just put your hand on your heart. Pray for yourself. Ask the Holy Spirit to come. Holy Spirit, come. Pray in these, right now, but also in these days and weeks. That days coming. Don't wait weeks. Days coming. People will feel refreshing of your spirit. Hope would come where there's been despair. Pray that those who are weary would be strengthened. They would rise up with wings like eagles. They, they look to you. You restore and rebuild our lives that we would have strength to, uh, to pray one on our right, one on our left to receive strength together. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. God bless you. And back to you, Dan. Yeah, thanks for that, Tim. If we could give him a hand. That was a great message. Yeah, it was a really good message, and um, you know, if if I want my life to look different in six months' time, in in a year's time, you know, different than and better than what it is today, then I make the changes today, you know, small changes maybe, and then they work themselves out over time. So if I make a change today, that affects tomorrow. But if I don't make any changes then guess what? My life will be the same. You know, madness can be defined as doing the same thing every time and expecting different results. It doesn't work like that. So, you know, thanks, Tim, for that challenge. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, thank you to everyone who's listened online as well. So, as I say, uh, church prayer meeting, 7 p.m. tonight as well. It'll be good to see you there. And, you know, if, if you've watched this for the first time and you don't know Jesus, you just have to cry out to him. You just have to close your eyes and with a prayer from your heart, say, Father, I thank you that you sent Jesus to die for me. I accept him now as my saviour. Father, come into my life. And that will begin the process of change. That will start to see the will of God working out in your life, you know? So anyway, God bless everyone. Have a very good week, and uh, we'll see you again soon. Amen. Amen.